here we go guys to celebrate our hundredth Amstream the legend himself from Amstrad the guy that built the Amstrad CPC 464 and many other things along with many other talented people of course Mr. Ronan Perry of Amstrad here we go so hello Roland and thank you very very much for taking the time to talk to me and the Amstream community I know they are all very very excited and appreciative too and it's definitely a rare treat for them so I was gonna say it's really really nice to see you in lots of Amstrad related Facebook groups recently um, interacting with all the passionate fans there and they absolutely love it you're almost hero worship there Roland by some how does it feel how sorry how does it feel to see so many thousands of Amstrad enthusiasts after all this time nearly 40 years later it's quite surprising really because um, there hasn't been a great retro interest in the 464 until quite recently I think we, we, we sort of half-heartedly had to have a tried to have a 30-year revival and that didn't really work and so it's nice that it's finally happened I'm very you know pleased to be able to join any of those retro groups mainly on Facebook celebrating the machine yes uh, do you feel very very proud of what you accomplished back then and seen all these thousands of people still loving the machine well, I think it's great because you know we did put a lot of effort into designing it in the first place very much a one-off project and um, it's nice that people are still using it all these years later and of course then you've got the retro interest coming back in mm. and the, you know it, it's almost a modern antique really yes um, do, you, do you ever keep abreast of any of the new hardware and software being made for the Amstrad? Um, no, not really. Um, I mean, I've heard that there are some simulators and things like that, but uh, I don't, uh, don't actually do much hands-on when it comes to the forces. No. I thought you might be interested in this, Ray. I don't know if you'll see it on the camera. But this is uh, an M4 Wi-Fi board. You can now get your Amstrad CPC 464 connected to the World Wide Web. <laughs> How does that make you feel knowing that the humble 464 can now get on the internet at all? Well, I think, you know, we, we did comms on the 464 right from the very beginning. Um, we had a, a modem and people could access Presto. Uh, we had a Presto simulation software. So being online with the 464 is nothing new. Oh, I suppose, yes, of course, yeah. It, you know, it's just nice that it's um, been able to track developments in the online world, go from bulletin boards to Prestel, all the way onto the internet. Indeed, yeah. Um, so let's um, let's go back to the days of Amstrad in the 1980s, and we'll start right at the beginning. Um, where did you um, grow up, and what were your interests as a young boy and lad? Well, I grew up in Chelmsford in Essex and went to school at Brentwood. Um, my interests were very much in electronics, so at school mainly that was audio. So building one's own um, hi-fi systems, that sort of thing. I had some chums who were very much into amateur radio and they used to build their own transmitters and receivers for amateur radio. Fantastic. So that's the sort of stuff I did. And then in about, um, uh, I suppose it would have been 1968, um, something like that, we got the opportunity to be able to use the computer at the local technical college but then I swerved across and started doing quite a lot of work on programming excellent and I believe you met um, William Pohl at school is that correct and you formed Ambit together later on well that's right I mean we're in the um, uh, we're in the same year at school we we're never exactly in the same class at school but we we're in the same year he he worked a lot on the radio amateur side um, we stayed in touch and the ambit idea really blossomed in, in it was in my third year at university when William started it as a mail order business for the simple reason that many of the components that you needed to build um, what were then state of the art um, mainly two meter uh, transceivers most of those parts are only available 
um, in the trade, so to speak. As an individual, um, there was no way you could go and buy one. So he had this idea of setting up a small distribution company. He'd go off to people like Mullard and so on in those days, buy a hundred, which was their minimum order, <laughs> keep one or two for himself and sell the other 98 on uh, in small ads in uh, various monthly magazines right um yes because um so amstrad brought you and william as ambit in on the amstrad cpc4 pro cpc464 project in august of 1983 where was the cpc464 project currently at then and what sort of state was it in well it's all been pretty well documented in various books and i've got no complaint with uh, with the history in those um, what happened in those days was that each year Amstrad decided it needed a new um, sort of flagship product for that um, coming Christmas or not that coming Christmas, the Christmas after actually. Mm -hmm. So there we were in August um, building something to be in the shops uh, in a year and a month or a year and two months for, for the following Christmas and they'd done uh, audio equipment, they'd done music centres, they'd done um, CB radio, uh, was a famous one, and it got to the point where computers like the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum and the Apple II were sufficiently popular that that year's project was going to be a home computer. And they had two choices. One was, do we um, find some third party to manufacture it for us. So we basically badge somebody else's uh, design or do we have to go out and um, do it all from scratch? And uh, the answer they came to was no, we've actually got to do it all from scratch. And they found a couple of guys who promised to um, design it for them and deliver the final designs in July, August. And they just, frankly bit off more than they could chew. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand the complexity of it. Um, the spec itself was actually quite rudimentary and, and you know, nothing like as, uh, as advanced as the Vorsix or eventually turned out. No. And so one of the things which I did at that time, because that wasn't, I hadn't been at Ambit continuously from 1970 to 1980. I'd gone off and done lots of other things. So I'd kind of returned um, uh, to Ambit and one of my um, roles was what I call project rescue. <laughs> quite a lot of people, because Ambit then was quite a big components distributor and had lots and lots of customers, uh, often those customers will get into trouble having ordered lots of parts off Ambit, tried to put something into production, usually probably more like a hi-fi or a radio, um, got into trouble and then sort of were about to scrap the project. Well, if they had scrapped the project at that stage, Ambit would be left with lots of components with nobody to sell them to. Right. So um, what we used to do was go around and help these people out a bit and uh, just give them a nudge in the right direction so that they could, they could continue their projects and put their products on the market. And then we could um, you know, free up those items in, which were in the distribution channel. So to that extent, um, Although we obviously we, we weren't at that time selling any components to Amstrad for the 464 or the, or the 464 minus one, whatever we, we could call that. Um, when we were approached by Bob Watkins and said, they basically said, can you rescue this project for us? That's something we were quite familiar with doing. I'd put a lot of work into computers in the past. I'd, I'd built um, 8-bit computers um, going back as far as about mm, I don't know, 1970. Let me get my ears muddled up here. Um, <laughs> when, it's a long um, time ago, isn't it? <laughs> in 1976, probably, I started building 8-bit computers myself. Wow. Out of parts. And so I was quite familiar with both building the hardware and the kind of software that was for them. I'd been doing also a bit of freelance journalism, so I'd written reviews for monthly publications of products like the BBC Micro. Mm. I was quite familiar with that. But somewhere I've still got one of my kind of souvenirs from those days, which is a circuit diagram of the BBC Micro on a bit of paper about four foot square. Mm. That's good fun. So quite familiar with it. And so when, when we actually started the project, 
what what we had to do was first of all was find the find the hardware and software engineers who were going to do all the legwork. Um, but we also, having found them, sat down with them. We said, well, look, let's not repeat any of the mistakes that we've seen in computers like the Spectrum, the Commodore 64, uh, the BBC Micro, and so on. Now, it's not to say, they, say those mistakes were fatal. All those machines sold perfectly well mm -hmm. uh, the way they were. But with hindsight, often you find, well, maybe we'd have done this differently, or maybe we'd have done that a little bit differently. And so what we tried to do was to make the 464 a computer that did all those things just slightly differently and slightly better. Yes, yes, indeed. So um, I'm going to skip over a few questions I had specific to the 464 and its development. You're right, it has been covered in lots of places already, including myself in articles. Um, so we'll skip forward a little bit here. Um, I'm trying to get through some important questions. So... Um, I mean, you're kind of viewed, Roland, as kind of a, a mythical person at Amstrad to like people like me and other people on the Amstrad scene. Maybe you could clarify your role at Amstrad after the 464 launched. Well, after we finished the 464 project, and, and on that project, I was really, I mean, you can call it a project manager or coordinator. Yeah. Um, I like to think of it a bit like a film director so you know you, what you're trying to do is put lots of skills from lots of other people together so a film director has got uh, script writers cameramen costume designers and obviously all the actors and what he's got to do is blend them all together to produce a finished product mm -hmm. that like so that, that that's the way I, I felt my role was what we went on to do with the 464 was we realized that it needed a um a support club a user club to keep momentum up and we started that originally because one of the um, prime directives was that when the computer launched there should be uh, 50 software titles available mm. so we went way into the shops it wasn't a case of um, well here's a computer and there's one or two games on the shelf and there might be another half dozen in three months if you're lucky we need to go in with a you know, big bang with yeah. enough software yeah. that people had a sufficient choice so we set up um, this organisation called Amsoft. Yes. <laughs> and um, what we did at Amsoft was we carried on the hardware development. So we developed the DDI-1, which is the disk drive. We developed a modem. Um, we developed a light pen uh, and, and several other add-ons like that. But that was, that was on that side of, of it. On the other side, we were still encouraging people to write games, being a bit of a games... Um, software publisher ourselves and of course running the user club and the user magazine. Now we were quite happy that lots of other people were designing and selling peripherals uh, separately, that was great, um, and there were lots of other different Amstrad magazines so we didn't see any of those as competitors and I think that's probably one of the reasons why the project was quite successful. I agreed, was, yes. It agreed. was, it was, we were deliberately very open about it and we published obviously the firmware manual uh, which allowed people uh, full access to all the facilities of the computer. I mean, they went on to find out other things about it that, you know, we didn't realise it would do, but we published, you know, here's what we think it does on, on day one. And people could phone me up if they were software developers or hardware developers and talk to me and say, oh, we're, we're trying to design this particular thing for your computer. Uh, we're a bit stuck, can you give us some help, point us in the right direction, and I was always very happy to do that. So in a sense, I was kind of uh, technical support to the Amstrad um, industry. Yes, yes. And did you uh, did you write the um, the manual at all, the 464? Were you involved with that? The 464 manual was basically um, jointly between myself, William Pohl and Ivor Spittle. Because that manual, I have to say, Roland, was fantastic. I remember as a seven-year-old or eight-year-old boy reading that cover to cover, and that's a that that says a lot. If an eight-year-old boy can really enjoy reading a manual and understand it, so I just wanted to say, very well done there. If you were part of that, <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for that. I mean, one of the things uh, you know, we realised that that had to be part of the package, and it had to you know say something useful. The the manual I prefer actually is the six one two eight manual mm -hmm. because we had. Quite a bit of time available to um, write. It's about 
got that three times as many pages, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, I can go uh, and so what we want, <laughs> what we wanted to do with that was to, to write a book, and I wrote most of that one. But what we wanted to do is write a book which explained not just how the how the six one two eight worked, but you know, what are computers anyway? You know, what can you do with them? How do you program them? So yes. on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then of course by then, we were doing parallel projects. So originally the 464 was the only thing we were doing. By a year later, we were doing the 6128 and the PCW word processor. And by a year after that, we were probably de-emphasizing the work we we're doing on internally anyway on the, on the CPC, still cracking on with the PCW, but doing work for the PC1512. And this kind of roller coaster thing well we what we used to talk about it was like planes landing at an airport you've got one on the runway one that's just taken off and another one that's you know coming in to land and so every any particular time we had probably three projects at various stages of development wow um sounds like a crazy time there how what, what was the um atmosphere in amstrad at the time if you if you worked in the offices there you had lord sugar he would sit with all the staff and be on the case of everyone. And some people have said it was a bit dog eat dog there and it was a quite a tough environment. Do you think that's fair, Roland? Or do you think it perhaps He he spent most of his time working with the sales and marketing people. Mm -hmm. But then I'd see him twice a day at least as well. One of the, one of the um essential bits of culture there which everybody um, complied with was first of all your chain to your desk, <laughs> right? So if somebody wants to contact you or phone you up or come and talk to you or sort something out, then they always know where you're going to be. Okay, they can't start chasing around the building looking for you, let alone <laughs> chasing off to some other building that you've just kind of wandered off to. Yeah. So. That was, that was quite important. Also, um, the culture was if a fax came in from a, a supplier or a customer in the outside world, that these got distributed around the company by various runners, and you had to have a reply done within preferably half an hour. Okay? Right. At the most, most probably an hour. And um, so you get rung up. You know, and all the copies went back, and everybody got circulated all the copies. So if if a fax came in asking some questions and you hadn't replied to it, people would start contacting you and saying, "Why haven't you replied to this fax yet?" <laughs> and and that kept everyone, in a sense, kept everyone on their toes. It also meant that your intray was fairly slim because you, you know, as soon as something came in, it went out again. Sure. And you just you know just had to to do that. And of course, one of the, that actually made Amstrad a great company for outsiders to work with because they knew that if they sent us a question or wanted some clarification or something, we'd come straight back with it, you know, at worst on the same day. And at the time, a lot of organizations were dealing with, with uh, computer companies in the United States and they're on eight or nine hours time difference there. And they find it quite quite difficult dealing with them, whereas we were dealing with suppliers largely in the Far East, in Japan, and again there was a eight or nine hour time difference. But what it meant was they worked through our night, wrote lots of faxes. They're on our desks in the morning. We answer them during the day, and then when they came back into work, there there it all was. So you're actually right. getting things done twice as fast because you've got these overlapping shifts. Whereas, so what a lot of people found to be a tremendous handicap, we found to be a you know, great advantage. Mm. Seems like Amstrad was quite a trendsetter, really, back then as well. Um, so different to a lot of the established companies of the era, making similar products or whatever. Um, so um, I'm going to ask... Let me just find a question here. I know you haven't got much time, Roland, so I'll crack on. Um... A couple of people have asked this one. I know you're mu not much of a gamer, Roland, so or uh, much into the games. But um, two questions: the Roland character in those Amsoft games was named after you. That that is correct, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And um, 
<laughs> someone's asking here, do you have a favourite Roland game? And do you know what the very, very first game that arrived um, for Amsoft at all? The first games that arrived were Roland in the Caves and Roland on the Ropes. Oh. So those both came from Indiscomp, who were essentially pitching to be our uh, Spanish distributor. That's right, yes. And so, so they turned up with these games under their arm and said, look, look how clever we are. We've got you your first two games, <laughs> uh, you know, sign on the dotted line, which, which we, of course, did. So those were the first two games. They're both fairly basic games, to be honest. Oh, I love Ray Lodge on the Ropes. That's my mm. favourite. <laughs> I think that's where I think that's where the, the idea of calling them Rope, because they're both renamed from their original name, which was quite different. Yeah, I think, I think it was Fred that, it was called in Spain, Roland on the Ropes, and yeah, well, was, Bugaboo, was Bugaboo, Bugaboo the Flea or yeah. something, yeah. And so the idea was, that's when the idea was hatched, well, they both got a little creature in them, so why don't we call them, um, you know, name the creature Roland, and, and then we can have a series of games. Of course, the next game to arrive was Harrier Attack. Ah, lots of people so love that, actually, that one. They didn't actually fit that mould. So that was you can't, you can't that, have Roland in the planes or something, no. Yeah, so <laughs> Roland goes in the RAF or something, but so we didn't, <laughs> didn't do it with that one. Um, I think at the time, my the game I liked the best was Roland in Time. Hmm. I like that because it's got a good plot, it's got um, lots of different um scenes, it's got 10 or 12 different um eras that it. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Also, it was written by somebody at uh, you know who uh, camped out in the back of my office, so we could yeah. go along and look yeah, at it. Darren White, I think it was, wasn't it? Or sorry, or, his name Darren White, I think. Or am I thinking of someone else? Oh, it doesn't matter anyway. But, yeah. That name doesn't ring a bell. But he was a, he was a fairly local software um, developer, and um, I, I think he did quite a lot of the work, design work, actually on the Spectrum. Um, and then ported it across to the uh, CPC, but uh, it, he didn't really have a, you know, a, an office or workshop of his own, so we just cleared the bench for him at the back of the office and he used to come in every day and work <laughs> on it there, which meant, he, of course, he always had equipment available, and um, if he had any questions to ask, he could ask us. Of course, we'd go and, go and peer over his shoulder and make uh, comments <laughs> about the gameplay of it. Of course, you had the uh, Doctor Who TARDIS and the theme song in there as well, which is in the days where BBC and other companies didn't seem to sue for copyright. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it was, um, um, you know, it, 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 it's not something that any anybody ever came to us and complained about, let's say that. <laughs> sorts of things yeah so one big topic um probably moving for fast forward a few years here that everyone seems to want to know about is the the plus range and the gx4000 um first of all what was your involvement did you have any involvement in that and what was amstrad's thinking at the time and a follow-up question would be that unfortunately it was a bit of a flop so how did that affect things within amstrad at the time well, I had very little to do with it. Um, my chief engineer was Cliff Lawson, and he had much more to do with that particular yeah. machine. Um, I think part of the idea was um, if if your customers pester you for a console, you know, enough, you say, "Oh, we give up. We'll, we'll make you a console then." <laughs> and so, and so then you've got to say, "Well, what's this console going to be like? You know, is it going to be compatible with it? Is it going to be a brand new?" Um, design was it going to be to some extent backwards compatible and our games computers obviously the, the CPC so that's what you'd make it backwards compatible with and so on and so forth so we rolled up our sleeves and we designed it I think it works perfectly well um, mm. one of the features was that it came with a, a, a point of sale console a bit like a kind of fruit machine thing that, that um, the shops could put in there so people could go up to it and have a play with it and I think I think it was a rack of Oh the demonstration rack. yeah I think I sent you a photo of that didn't I Roland yeah one turned up on in Spain in a car garage recently of all places but yeah yeah that's right so so that um so we had to design that console as well 
Um, but I did have, have very little to do with it, to be perfectly honest. Oh. And have, um, you know, with it being a bit of a flop, and I, I love it, I love the 6128 Plus, it's my favourite Amstrad computer, but uh, with it being a bit of a flop, did, did it? how did it affect things within Amstrad at the time, or were you already sort of moving on? Because I think you left in December 1990 to go it alone, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, again, so I just have to say again, it was a project which I was aware of. Yeah. Know, and and um, you know gave Cliff Lawson any assistance that he felt he needed. But it was more his project than mine. Yeah, I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to blame him there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, um, I, mean, I mean, the main thing, the main, the main part of it that I was involved with actually uh, thinking about it was the copy protection on the um, cartridge. Oh, the acid chip, I think it's called, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, that was something which was um, one of the parameters that people said, no, we've got to have the, we've got to have copy protection on the cartridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a kind of a more of an academic computer scientist myself than many of the others there, I, I had to go off and um, source a, a suitable scheme for that. Yes, indeed. Um, so we'll just probably finish up then. We've had a couple of questions from the community. We had we had one earlier. Um, let me find the most interesting one. Uh, what was your uh, quite a simple question really? What was your favourite memory of your time working with the CPC? And that's from Dave Velociraptor, believe it or not. <laughs> um, I think. Um, I think probably the um, CPC shows. So we, we had various shows at places like Alexandra Palace. Because mm -hmm. um, what I remember taking, the, the, before the machine was launched, I remember taking the team to um, a, a Sinclair show, which was at Alexandra Palace. So we rented a minibus for the weekend and I drove everybody out there to look at it. And what we were trying to do was kind of build a critical mass of interest in, in, in the CPC and like a sort of morale boosting for the team. We went up there and we looked around and saw the way that there were lots of people selling third party games and peripherals and the public was really excited about it. And I said to them, um, I know you think this is kind of just a one off project, um, but I think one day we'll we'll have an Amstrad show like this. And they said, Oh we bonkers Roland, you'll never catch on that much. <laughs> So, uh, but that was part of the part of what we did, and we also had a developers conference. At um, it was at the. Can't remember. It keeps changing its name. It was I think, in those days. It was the Holiday Inn, I think, at um, uh, near Heathrow. Mm -hmm. So it's the one that's one junction towards Slough from actually Heathrow, and so we hired their kind of auditorium, and any software developer who was interested in writing games for us came for the day we gave them all a firmware manual and a t-shirt and a pep talk and said there you go go off and write some games for us and again it was trying to create this um, community at the time for a product which hadn't even been launched excellent I, I love that so, I think, that so, got, so yeah. I think what I'm saying it was it was generating that community spirit which mm. I think was one of the, you know, one of the favorite things I did there I'm really glad you said that because yeah, that I, I did really feel like there was a community of Amstrad owners back then. It was from the user club to the newsletters to the uh, there was you had the magazine of course as well, and the customer support. So they're, they're really and so many independent user groups sprung up from that as well, and they, some of them still exist today. So you know that says a lot, and I think you said sort of set a blueprint really for other companies to follow. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, we, we, we were very involved with our customers. In a sense, we shouldn't have needed to be, because what a lot of companies said was, look, you didn't buy this computer off us, you bought it off Dixon's or Boots or Rumbelow's. And what do they know about so it? If yeah. got, so if you've got a problem with it, you go and talk to them. Okay? <laughs> now, what we did do was we, we trained, and again, you know, it fell to me to do most of this, we trained the... Um, service engineers at big companies like that and how to fix them if they went wrong. What we didn't do was do much training of their customer support teams. And people traditionally 
in those days, they probably still don't. If, if you buy a computer and you can't work, you know, it doesn't even be working for you, you don't ring the shop up, do you, and say, yeah. oh, you've got this thing, it doesn't work. You ring the manufacturer up. And so we used to have a quite a big department of um, uh, basically technical support staff that the customers were ringing up all the time and writing letters in. And I think there must have been well over a dozen people working in there by, you know, um, six or nine months after the computer was on. And if those staff ever had a question which they couldn't answer, then they'd escalate it to me. And about once a week, I'd end up talking to a customer on the phone. And a couple of times a day, I'd just scribble some notes in the margin on a letter that someone had written in, you know, giving the answer. Now, I wasn't only doing that to be nice to the customers. But what it meant was I was keeping in touch with what the customers thought about the machine, what they found easy to use about it, what they found difficult to use about it. And then that informed the way we designed later computers. Indeed. Okay. Um, I'll do a couple more questions, hopefully. Um, let me just see here. Um, Craig's Bar asks, uh, was it a mis Again, you've probably already answered this because you weren't really part of this, but was it a mistake not to make the plus computers and GX4000 not 16-bit, which was the trend at the time, the Atari ST and Amiga? Do you think that was a mistake? or? Um, we well, that was... Well, that was the decision I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Do you start from scratch or do you um, evolve an existing product? So having decided to evolve an existing product, then, you know, that's going to be 8-bit. Now, some people with hindsight might say, well, you should have done it a couple of years earlier. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we are where we are. And, and, and that's, you know, those are the decisions that were made. Indeed, yeah. So um, I'm just going to finish off then by saying, asking, do you um, do you still keep in touch with Lord Sugar, and do you ever catch up with him at all? I don't um, chat with him very much. I uh, I've met with Bob Watkins a few times over the last few years. I keep in I'm regular contact with William Pohl and several other members of the design team. Um, and actually one of my engineers was on Facebook um, today, a guy called Chris Honey, who started a company called Honeysoft. So he started his career being one of my junior engineers. Excellent. Um, so keep in touch with people like that. I keep in touch with um, Locomotive Software, uh, MEJ Electronics. Um, again, not quite on a daily basis, but reasonably so. And then every few years, there's some kind of reunion sort of ex Amstrad people, so there's a sort of a Christmas effectively a you know Christmas dinner that people get wow. together and reminisce about. So, you know, we, we get to meet one another there. In fact, um, as you probably know, Nick Hewer was the um, PR consultant for the four six four. He he devised the launch. Um, he um, facilitated the original um, Alan Sugar biography. And um, so, you know, we used to work very closely with him. And um, again, I've, and he's now gone on to, you know, bigger and greater things, but I still keep in touch with him from time to time. Excellent. I'm hoping one day I might get in, uh, an invite to that dinner. Who knows? But... <laughs> <laughs> there we are. I don't think I was in, I, think, I, I can't remember if I was invited last year. It's one of those things that kind of, it, it needs an enthusiastic person to organise it. Yeah. You and you don't get much thanks, <laughs> no. um, but uh, you know it does still happen from time to time. Because a lot of the people, a lot of the engineers at Amstrad, went on to design, went on on to more into the um, video and satellite side of the business. Yeah, and then they were, ended up working for Sky, and quite a few of them still work um, for Sky, doing set top boxes in an office just up the road from the old Amstrad one in Brentwood. So that's if you like. That's the, that's the remaining core of you know the, the old Amstrad personnel. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I, I guess. Um, do we have any more time for questions, Roland, or do you need to get going? No, I think it's probably about time to. But, yeah. Yeah. Do, do 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 get in touch. You know, in 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 uh, the coming weeks and whatever, and we can have another chat then. 
That'd be fantastic. We could have a follow-up um, chat and interview or whatever another time. But you've been with us for half an hour now, Roland, and we are greatly, greatly appreciative of it. Uh, appreciative of it. Sorry. Thank you for giving up your uh, time to talk to me today. Um, okay. I'm... Yeah, you're, you're welcome. And of course, it's you know, it's, it's got me um, um, back on Skype again. I've been on Skype for twenty years, but it's all I've been off it for a little bit. So. <laughs> uh, prompting me to get back involved again and actually on a topical note what with this lockdown and everything i've spent more time talking to old friends and colleagues than ever i did last year or the year before <laughs> We're using online so much more that's quite that's quite a in a sense a positive outcome of it all yeah there's upsides everywhere so mm. Mm. So thank you, Roland. I hope um, at some point you might want to check out some of the new projects and stuff. I might send you a link to um, the incredible game called In Pinball Dreams, which someone was asking me to ask you about, but I know you haven't seen it. So maybe I'd like to send that to you, a video, you watch it, and you give us your yeah. feedback and opinion on it, because yeah. okay, what, then. What, what they've managed to pull out the 464 there is mind-blowing to most of us and be inter interesting to see your reaction to that at some point but thank you again roland thank you the amstring community thanks you there are thousands of amstrad fans you're going to make, make very very happy today so thank you roland take care yeah. and all the well, best thank you you're welcome sure then thank you take care goodbye <laughs> <laughs> and there you go guys mr roland perry um, it looks like you all enjoy that there. What a lovely, lovely, modest, humble, and wonderful man. And Roland, if you're by any chance, if you're watching this, thank you again from the bottom of my heart for taking the time out of your busy day uh, to talk to little old me um, for like 40 odd minutes there. Uh, thank you very, very much, Roland. And it looks like everyone's enjoyed that there. Fantastic. What I loved about that at the end that surprised me was like Rodan said get back in touch in, a, in a, a few weeks and we'll do another interview. So he really enjoyed that I think and um, looks like we're going to have a follow up interview. So thanks for watching guys I hope you enjoyed that if you did please click a like below leave a comment and also subscribe if you haven't already and over that way there's another video for you to check out. Zypho out.